Hello, everybody. Good evening. Hello. Thanks for coming. Um, tonight, we have a special lecture. I'm very excited um, to welcome the lecturer, but also to announce the Douglas C. Allen lecture. It's a very particular landscape-oriented lecture. And our guest today um, is Dilip and Dilip Takuna. He has uh, incredible work done, which we will go into hear more about soon. And um, it is quite important for us in, at the moment for um, School of Architecture to really look into the cross-scalar approach, engaging from a regional level all the way down to the integration of, of um, the systems of systems of architecture. So this is one part of our major journeying across the scales. And tonight we are probably on a very large regional, if not, um, I guess, global scale to be seen. And um, before we go there, I would like to quickly remind everybody a um, few more lectures to come um, that we have set out. Um, um, Ellen, Dan Jones, and myself in collaboration uh, for the School of Architecture, but also beyond, of course, for the um, College of Design. And uh, one is the one that we're looking at today, the Douglas C. Allen Lecture. The second one is the Atlanta Talks, where Alan is going to talk about um, the reimagining of suburban neighborhood infrastructure. I'm typically the host for the Atlanta Talks. The Atlanta Talks is a little bit of a new venue where we're trying to bring in different groups of people uh, that are discussing pressing topics of today, in particular within the framework um, of the urban complex we are in, Atlanta City. And so um, with Alan, we welcome Commissioner Ted Terry and also Kai Uwe Bergman, who currently is here, one of the Portman um, visiting critics. Um, just so that you know, Uwe was here today. Um, and uh, gave desk crits to all of our 76 Portman students. And um, they are excited and it's really remarkable to see how we all collaborate together and do this journey across the scales. And then um, next week, we have um, another Atlanta talk, which is redesigning for circular economy. And this in particular um, will be featuring Bureau Hoppold, um, which is one of this um, high-end engineering firms. It is featuring CDC um, with um, Liz York and is also going to be um, looking into the work of uh, Walker Architects, in particular Walker Architects and Bureau Hapold have been working together on a rehab of a project. We also invited um, the leader of um, South Face, because they worked heavily on a living building here on campus. And we hope to see you all there as well for the circular economy discussion. Um, but now let's shift to today and I hope it forwards. Yes, so today really I would like to first invite up to the stage and this is his backdrop, um, a very good friend of DLIP who has agreed to share some of the insights of DLIP's earlier path. Um, and as a Sabu, Sabu, Shubru, sorry, I keep <laughs> mispronouncing. That's all right. Uh, welcome to the 2023 Douglas C. Allen Lecture. I'm Shubra Guha Thakurta. I'm a professor in the School of City and Regional Planning, and I direct a research center called the Center for Spatial Planning Analytics and Visualization. I know many of you here, so uh, I'm delighted to be introducing somebody who I have known for 25 years. But before I introduce him, I should talk about Doug Allen, who I have also known. As he was a dear friend of mine. And uh, Doug Allen was a highly respected and beloved professor at this college for 37 years. He was a landscape architect by training, and his classes attracted students from architecture, urban design, planning, and also from engineering and humanities. He served as the associate dean for academic affairs in the college for five years, as interim dean for a year, and as senior associate dean for another three years. So he has left uh, a deep imprint on this college. After his passing in 2014 from brain cancer, his former students 
and colleagues endowed an annual lecture series in his name, the Douglas C. Allen Lecture invites renowned landscape architects and architects from the US and all over the world to come and lecture here at the college. So coming to this year's lecture. So this year's lecture is particularly a treat for me. I had never imagined that I would be introducing a dear friend and and an intellectual sparring partner to deliver a lecture of this renown, mostly because I'm still grappling with the concepts he had posed to me when we were students at Berkeley. Dilip Dakuna's ideas goes to the bottom of the fundamental questions we take for granted. We take certain realities, certain categories for granted and hold on to your seats because he will be questioning the ground reality. Everything that you know to be your normal daily lives will change. So he asked these fundamental questions and in the process, he changes the way we see things and we begin to question our own reality. If we needed a reality check about anything that we did, we can always rely on Dilip to tell us why we are doing it all wrong. Some of our professors were hesitant to engage uh, Dilip in their classes, mostly because they failed to match his wavelength. And that's what we were always hearing from either from Dilip or from his professors. Dilip's approach to the world of ideas and their formation always fascinated me, especially when paired with his excellent culinary skills. His biryanis were a huge hit among our friends. And his friends, including myself, were skeptical, very skeptical about his chances of bringing his ideas to reality. But magic happened when Anu Mathur came into his life. Anuradha Mathur, his late partner and soulmate, was the perfect inspiration Dilip needed to express his ideas in concrete forms. It began one of the fairy tale partnerships that has taken almost a legendary form in the domain of landscape architecture. Together, they wrote several books, curated exhibitions, conducted studios, created art, and transform the discipline of landscape architecture. Anu Mathur passed away last year around this time. In fact, they were supposed to be here doing the same lecture and we miss her dearly. Dilip Dakuna has continued the journey that Anu and he started together. He wrote his most recent book by himself, a book called The Invention of Rivers, Alexander's Eye and Ganga's Descent, which won the ASLA Honor Award and the J.B. Jackson Book Prize. He's also the recipient of the Guggenheim Award in 2020. He continues to teach and write and inspire new generations of landscape architects and planners. And his most recent studios are highly subscribed. His students really want to be with him because they don't realize what they will come out of will be completely different from how they go into those studios. That kind of a transformative experience can only be had if you spend some time with Dilip. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Dilip Dakuna. And, and hopefully by the time he's done, you'll begin to see things differently. So Dilip. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, that should be great. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Shubhru. That was such a generous introduction. I didn't know I left an impact like that. I'm sure not. <laughs> I mean, no wonder they kicked me out of Berkeley so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, 
Yes, I actually did, in, did enjoy my, my conversations with Shubhru at that time. And, and he is so right to point out uh, the fact that uh, meeting Anu actually and, uh, and working with her on issues of landscape really gave me a subject to, to dwell on and, uh, and develop. And I always told Anu that, um, that I'm, and she was as well, so thankful that we found a subject in water, which I will talk about today, that, um, that has really allowed us to develop uh, certain, I would say, a certain critique, I mean, and, and alternatives to, to habitation and, and thinking about, about habitation. And that way, I really consider myself very, 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 very fortunate, um, well, to have friends you know, and as as well as uh, to have found uh, found Anu, and uh, it's a pity. I know she would have loved to have been here and uh, and been part of this. Um, I did find her notes in preparation for the lecture last year. You know, when we were going to speak about a sectional imagination, and I'm going to touch on that. Um, but uh, we were going to share share with you some of the some of the projects that came out of uh, out of our first year studio in landscape. Uh, that was that's very sectional driven, but uh, maybe I'll keep that for another time. Um, there are things that have sort of evolved since then, which I would like to speak to today. Uh, so, well, I mean, one cannot avoid talking about concerns now that are outside of the, well, all around us, you know? I mean, we're talking about sea level, sea levels, rising, we are talking about storm events that are becoming increasingly unpredictable uh, and increasing in ferocity. Um, we're talking about glaciers melting, we're talking about ice caps uh, melting, we're talking about uh, rain patterns changing. Um, now, all of these are generally seen, generally seen by most people, I would think, scientists and others, as constituted by climate change and um, are seen as problems. Now, Anu and I sort of beg to defer a little. We don't see these as problems. We see them as consequences. Consequences of a land-centric paradigm. A paradigm that has, that has consumed water and has generally defer, defined water on its terms. Land, that defines water on its terms, land that has put water you know, in the service of itself. So you just think about it, water drains the land, water serves land for power, water, you know, it, it does all kinds of things for the sake of land. So water has been subservient. So in short, in today's language of the street, what we say is water is having a me too moment. Yeah. So given that, you know, the question that we ask is what are the terms of water? What is water on its own terms? And we call that wetness. So it's not that we want to take water and now oppose land or put land on the terms of water. That wouldn't be fair because water itself is on the terms, as we know it, is on the terms of land. So when we talk about wetness and we talk about a wet imagination, we are wanting to see water on its own terms and ask the question about what would it be for habitation and design to be on, on, the, terms of, on the terms of wetness. And so that is, that is what a wet imagination is. So this question really began, you know, when Anu and I worked on the Mississippi. I mean, this is really Anu's project. I mean, she really led this project initially when we came to, when we came to Penn. Um, and, uh, and I tagged along and then got swallowed in. And, uh, and then, you know, there was no, there was no looking back. Uh, but it was really in the lower Mississippi that uh, many of the questions that we speak about today were initiated. And so let me give you a sense of, of how it was initiated. So here we were in the lower Mississippi. So that's from Cairo down. Um, we are talking about, you know, where the Ohio joins uh, the Mississippi um, to the Gulf. And we, you know, we had four sites. Uh, we chose four sites, and uh, and we we investigated it. We 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 drove uh, we drove through them, and we documented them. We traveled. We traveled 
the so-called Mississippi River, uh, you know, confined by its levees. Uh, we climbed on levees. I mean, we had all kinds of adventures, uh, you know, in this in this in this place. So it was just a just a fantastic, fantastic experience. Yeah, we traveled down in a barge, you know, down the down the Mississippi, uh, from Memphis to to New Orleans, and um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I I've got a lot of stories to tell on that, uh, you know, on that uh, you know the anarchist crew actually uh, on the on the tugboat. Um, and um, this was for us ground zero. This is a model of the Mississippi that uh, outside Jackson, Mississippi, the Mississippi Basin model. Um, I mean, it's a remarkable, you know, event. I mean, a, mark, a remarkable, um, I would say, uh, scheme, you know, on which so much of the controls of the Mississippi were first tested. I mean, and those, uh, I mean, and those uh, women actually over there, I mean, are actually modeling, and because this is the way in which the Army Corps of Engineers reached out to the public to make them feel comfortable that they had the Mississippi in control. So they were part of an, an advertisement, you know, that, uh, you know, and, and you can see, you know, you're standing on this model, you're in command, you know, I mean, this thing is down in scale. And so the vertical, there's a vertical scale, there's a horizontal scale, and there is a time scale. So the water that enters this, uh, this, this, this model is timed. I think it's, it's one hour on the model is the equivalent of a day in the Mississippi in, in the real world. And, and those are some of the interventions that came out of the testing of this model. And in case you're sort of wondering what this is, all this, I mean, that is to, to uh, you know, is, is the coefficient of friction, you know, by which, you know, you sort of add this to the concrete, but this is a concrete model and it's 40 acres and it's built by German prisoners of war in the 1940s. Anyway, so we looked at, you know, that was our lead. And then we looked at the archives. We went into, we went into looking at the thing, but this is the question that really drove us. And that is that the way you represent landscape is then the way it dictates the way you design it. So what you have over here, you know, beginning in the 1600s, 1500s, 1600s, you know, in the 15, actually it begins in 1541 when Hernando de Soto, the conquistador, arrives and, and defines, you know, sort of draws a line between land and water and says, that's, that's water, this is land, that's a river, this is land, you know, and, and those lines have stuck and they have grown, they have, you know, become levees that are like 40 to 50 feet high, you know, and now you have that project flood over there by the, by the Army Corps of Engineers by which you can measure the flows now of this channel, you know? So who defines the channel, you know, so on. I mean, and, you know, I'll come, I'll come to that, uh, you know, in a, in a bit. Um, we did screen prints, uh, you know, that, uh, that brought out these issues. There were multiple layers of, of screen prints, but it was just our way of investigating the, you know, the, uh, uh, the way landscape operates actually as a, as a system that brings together so many issues that, uh, that uh, play into, into one another to construct what is ultimately you know, a complexity. But one of, the, one of the objectives of doing these screen prints I always saw was you know, that we have simplified landscape. When you do screen printing in multiple layers, you send the simplified version into a complexity in the hope that it, you know, an, another reality emerges from it. And it often did, you know, especially with the studios that followed this, this investigation. Uh, but what I want to come down to actually is this particular, um, uh, you know, site that really has remained with us. And that is the Native American mounds. They are high grounds that, uh, that, uh, that, were all over the lower Mississippi at one time. And here it is in the Delta itself had so many and they've all been knocked down, you know, except for a handful here and there. But what this brought to our attention was a very different system of dealing with water, if you will. So over here you have, I and mean, this is the 1927 flood. And on the left, you have the levee that contains the Mississippi on the right there, and then this is, this is of course the flood, you know, when the levee breaks, you have water on, on both sides. But the idea of the levee is that you contain water so that land will be free. Whereas over there, you have the Mississippi Mounds where you contain land so that water is free, you know? So if you think about it, I mean, many would say, oh, that's another system of flood control. 
you know, and, and this is, uh, you know, this is one, that is two, but that's not flood. That is, in fact, a different Mississippi because you don't have a line, you don't have flood. So that was not flooding. This is, that's the rise and fall of a Mississippi, a Mississippi, and this is the flow and flood of a Mississippi. This is a river. That is what we call an ocean of wetness. You know, the wetness is everywhere. You, know, you engage it on very different terms. So indigenous people here did not necessarily see a river to begin with. They saw wetness and they inhabited this wetness. You know, so we see water over there, we see a river, we see the earth's surface. They did not see necessarily an earth's surface. They lived between clouds and aquifers. You know, and so that is the horizon is what mattered to them. Whereas over here, it was the lines that contained the river. So what this, what that really led to were two, two angles to our practice. One is, you know, projects that demonstrate a new language of habitation. The other is design, a design activism towards decolonization. So I want to just first speak about the projects. And I'm just going to show you, share with you one project that we did in Norfolk, you know, wherein, you know, we explored the possibility that, I mean, the possibilities that we learned from the, from the mounds, uh, from the Native American mounds. Um, so this is, this is the lower Chesapeake. This is part of a, of a project called the Structures of Coastal Resilience, uh, wherein we were dealing with, you know, with post hurricane Sandy, you know, there were these projects rebuilt by design. There was also this, um, uh, and, and there were five teams associated with it. And uh, we were given Norfolk in, uh, in Virginia as a site. Um, and really the explore, exploring of, uh, of, of, the, of the lower Chesapeake. Um, so what happens, yeah, so that's the Chesapeake, I, I, mean, I guess, uh, oops, uh, I guess the, the pointer is not, it doesn't matter. Uh, so what I want to point out here is that when we look at the coastline, uh, we, it moves actually two ways. When a surveyor draws a coastline, they draw this in points. They draw points actually, and then they connect the points with a line. So that's how a surveyor sites a coastline. You know, how they find the points, where they draw the points in a marsh, in a, you know, in a mangroves and all that, that's still a mystery to me. I mean, I've asked a couple of surveyors, they just, you know, you know, they tell me, yeah, you know, where do you draw the line between land and water? I mean, I actually I challenge anybody to draw a line between land and water. It's always a guess. You know, it's always a way by which you draw a line and then land reaches it. That's the way you do it. You know, so anyway, so here is a point and you draw, the, you draw a line that then connects it. And so we're familiar with this side of it, the coastline. What we say is, if you just leave those points as they are and actually go the other way, you will find that there are so many, I mean, species, design of boats, the way the keels are designed, that really respect, you know, that salinity gradient between salt and, and fresh. And so if you now think about the coastline, not as a line, I mean, the coast, not as a line, but as a series of lines going the other way, you might arrive at something like this. So here you have a plan depiction of the coastline, you know, that connects the points. Over there, you have a series of sections that do not necessarily connect to one another. It's just a different way of perceiving of perceiving the coast. Because what it then allows for is what we call fingers of high ground. So it's literally turning the coast. And then what happens is you begin to see that this is the way in which a coast could really be read. So if you, if you go up Virginia, you know, uh, down from, from Richmond, which is somewhere here, you know, Washington is up there. This is the fall line. You have these fingers coming down, you know, so you have the James River, the Rappahannock, and so on till the, till the, the Potomac, you know, and so then you go down to a smaller scale, and you will see that of them, you also have fingers coming down. And then you have, if you go up these creeks, and you find that you, again, you know, at another scale, you find fingers coming down. So the whole coastline has these fingers of low ground and high ground, you know, so if you think about the webs as low ground, and that is the way the East Coast was. 
until the settlers, European settlers came in and they leveled the whole place. So the loss of the, of the low ground has led now to, you know, where does the water go? That's the question. That's the question we have now, because we've put them in pipes underground. We have done all kinds of things like that. So what does it mean to recover the fingers of high ground? You know, and so there you get a sense also of what it means to construct these fingers and to allow for a time dimension, not a spatial understanding of land use, but a time understanding of land use. So if I go into the low ground and I have a play field, for example, over there, if the sea wants to come in, you know, at some particular point in time in a surge, it can, can be allowed to come in. You know, so, so there's a way by which we can, we can begin to inhabit a coast as a high ground, low ground situation rather than a, a land sea division. Or sometimes what we call it, we call a, a rain tide understanding rather than a land water understanding. Rain and tide are, t are temporal phenomena as opposed to spatial spatial phenomenon. So here you see the application of two understandings now. One is a levee system that you have over there that leads to a closed system. You now you won't build a levee all around the city of Norfolk, but you might build in smaller, in smaller units. So you have multiple levees within levees just to be, just to be more resilient so that when, when any one of them fails, it doesn't send the whole city under. But this is still a closed system, a levee system. And, and on, the, on the lower front, this, uh, row, you see, you see a, a finger of high ground system. The question now is how can we realize the fingers of high ground? You know, and uh, the, so you see it's an open system, much more resilient, you know, and you know, that allows for species migration to come in on the, low, on the low ground. So now it's two gradients. You have a high ground gradient and you have a low ground and a low ground gradient. So, those two sort of meet, and that's how you, you know, you you construct a, an open a city that is open to the sea, not not closed. So we looked at various gradients because now that's the language that we are speaking now. We're speaking gradients. We're not speaking absolute land and sea. We're talking about these gradients. So where are these gradients? So we looked at all kinds of gradients. We looked at the cypress tree. We looked at, uh, you know, we looked at the keel, you know, boats. Uh, we looked at, uh, we looked at uh, fishes, crabs, you know, all of them appreciate a gradient of a certain, of a certain kind. So, so this is our sort of documentation of various kinds of, various kinds of gradients uh, that don't see the world in black and white, but see it, you know, with this, with, with a lot in, bet in between. We tested out some of these fingers in various places. We found conditions in which these fingers already exist. So can we appropriate them in, in some way? Highways, for example, are already high grounds, uh, fingers of high ground that we could, we could, uh, we could appropriate, uh, you know, and, uh, and all kinds of. Um, and then we, we began to look at two projects where we, we realized some of these ideas. And so, so this, was, um, this was on the Elizabeth um, in uh, Lambert's point, uh, wherein we, you know, we, it was a rail yard where the trains come in with coal to, to load onto, onto ships. And, uh, and you can see what the situation might be with sea level rise um, and, and how we began to, to uh, work this way of building up and building down so that we could contain water. So holding water back on high ground was one way to, to, save, to save the city. Uh, and and this is how each of these of three conditions of the of this of this one particular finger operates. You know, so all you have to do is really construct low ground. So you can get a sense of what it is. So this is the condition today. That is what the condition. I mean, that's the condition. You know, once the project is is realized. So subtle difference in section, just to accommodate the sea. The basic thing is, do not fight the sea. You cannot fight the sea. And we are not only planning for surge, we are, we are designing for sea level rise. So most of the projects that you see around the world that speak of sea level rise are actually only fighting surge. So, so in the face of sea level rise, we've just got to, we've got to come up with a completely new uh, reading of, of a coastline in order to accommodate the sea and not fight it. Um, so I won't go into details here. These are, these are on the web. This is another site, Willoughby Spit. 
uh, that also you can see the construction of fingers in the sections uh, in the section over here compared to the existing condition of, over there. You know, so yeah, there's a website structures of coastal resilience. The question now is where do we get the soil? So there's a lot of dredging around in the in the lower Chesapeake uh, that uh, is undertaken by the Army Corps of Engineers, and they have this uh, cranny island that uh, where they actually hold all this stuff. So we constructed a whole notational system over here, a temporal appropriation of soil for different, for different conditions. And then people would ask, like, I mean, how are you thinking of these building high grounds? And I said, all you have to do is just look at the highway system across the United States that, have been, that has been constructed since the 1950s. And you see what an amazing amount of high ground we have actually constructed in this country. So why can't we think of, of a few high grounds for a city? You know, it's no, it's 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 not it's not something that is that is unimaginable, um, but it has to be done. You know, through you know, in a in a whole systemic, temporal, uh, strategic manner. Um, but ultimately, this is what we are working towards. We are working between tide and rain. You know, most of the people who are you know who are threatened with uh, you know whose lives are threatened are people on high ground, not necessarily on the sea. Those folks are actually covered by insurance, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, and and uh, and and the ability to to move. The folks actually who are on higher ground, who are you know, you know, more among, I mean, more of the poor, are those people who cannot move, and that is where the water is locked in, because when sea level rises, water cannot drain. So you have to find ways to hold. So it's all about holding versus draining, and uh, and that is something that I want to build on. So we called our project "Turning the Coast." because that's what it is. It's literally turning the coast. Now to go to the design activism part of our, of our work, you know, and, and, and this is more and more, I'm seeing this as, as moving towards decolonization, which is still very much with us. I mean, colonization is very much with us. But here I want to come up with a radical proposition uh, that um, is often, is, it's, it's not, not often said. I want to suggest that all of us, are both colonizers and colonized in one. Colonization has spared nobody. You know, whether it is settler colonialism in, this, in, in, uh, in, in countries like this or uh, Australia or Africa, or the, you know, this other form of, of colonialism that is not settler colonialism, I forget the word that is used, but you know, like in India and, and other places, um, that colonization has not spared anybody. And so what it really means is that all of us speak two languages. We speak two languages of place. We navigate contradictions without admitting to them. And I want to give you one example. We experience one thing and we represent something else. So I want to say, I want to point to this. I mean, I'm working on Colombia now. I mean, I've just come back from, from Bogota. And, um, and I asked GIS to give me a map of water, you know, and this is what it gave me, you know. So this is the waters of Colombia. That is the forests of Colombia, you know, the country. This is the entire country, you know. And so you have the, you know, you have the Atlantic, you have the, the Pacific, and you've got the Amazon, you know. So, so this is what you get. Now I ask you, has any of you been into a forest? Have you walked on leaves that are squishy? You walked, I mean, have, you, have you felt the wetness in the forest that's in the air? Here, there are, there are cloud forests, you know, where we are in Bogota, which is about 8,000 feet, you know, and a little higher, you have the Paramos, which is, you know, I mean, it is just clouds. You have as much wetness from clouds as you have from, you know, in the earth. My favorite example is a cucumber. You bite into a cucumber, you quench your thirst. A cucumber is 96% water. The sea is 96.5% water. Now you call the sea a water body, but you don't call a cucumber a water body. So the forest is a water body. So what is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of a drawing like this? This is what I call a nonsense drawing. You know, nonsense meaning it makes no sense. It's not common sense, it defies our common sense. Wetness is everywhere. It's in the air, it's in, you know, it's in clouds, it's in soil, it's in, it's in fruit, it's in us. We participate in wetness. 
So what is the meaning of a drawing like this? So this is what I mean by the contradiction. We don't even see it. Nobody bats an eyelid. This is the drawing that the United Nations work with. This is the drawing that all designers work with. Why? So this is a section of Humboldt, you know, from Cartagena, from the, from the Atlantic to the Paramos. That is 8,000 feet. So that's Bogota, you know, and the, and the wet, wet savanna. I want to suggest that we operate with two imaginations, the colonizer imagination and the colonized imagination. The colonizer imagination is a drain imagination. We think of land and we think of draining the land. And we think of our articulation of civilization. We think of the most civilized places as the best drained places. You know? So drain imagination, it's about how to get water off the land as fast as possible. That's how we think. But when a colonizer enters a country, they're looking to create rivers so that you can enter and extract and leave. Because I mean, this is a place of jungle. How do you enter a jungle? You need a waterway. So the waterway was the river. So the river provided that, that entry. So it was its entry and it was this exit. But whereas the colonized are people of rain. They live in an ocean of rain. So this ocean of, or the ocean of wetness, this ocean of wetness is, does not have a surface. This is between clouds. They live between clouds and aquifers. They accept their immersion in, in wetness. Here we come as supreme beings, and we stand and we say, okay, that's the river, this is the land. So what you have over here, you know, in the, in the drain imagination, you have water on the surface. So you've contained water to rivers, to lakes, et cetera, on the surface, and we have contained it to events that come and go. So this is the containment of water. Whereas on that side, in the, in the colonized uh, imagination, wetness is everywhere between clouds and aquifers, right? I mean, it is, and, and we are immersed in it. So that's a rain imagination. This is a drain imagination. Now think about how water moves. We think of water as flowing, because that's, that's you know, the obvious thing when you have a surface. Rain falls to a surface and flows to the sea. And, and, and that way, it is, it's something that then can be contained to a place. You know, so so this is this is the this is the imagination that you that uh, I mean of this is the movement of uh, of of water of rain on the surface, whereas over there you saw I mean it is it soaks, so it's it comes rain comes into a wetness that is already everywhere, so it just soaks its way down like a stain, a stain. So it goes into plants, it goes into the soil, it doesn't go into rivers. It doesn't drain off the land. I mean, there are drops that don't even have to touch the ground. They might just evaporate even before falling to the ground and then go, you know, I don't know, fall elsewhere, maybe India, you know, and uh, things. So there, there may be drops of water that have been circulating in the air forever. They have never touched the ground, you know. So that level of complexity and appreciation of wetness is very different from this appreciation of water on a surface. There's another thing that two times of habitation now, the colonizer habitation happens in a moment of time. So this is the, this is the hydrologic cycle. So this is precipitation, this is flow formation, this is, this is evaporation and that's cloud formation. So this is Paul Clay's drawing the, of the Bauhaus. Uh, you might be familiar with him. Um, but in this cycle, we have taken this moment and made it our moment of reality. So there's a clarity now, I can draw my maps, keeping rain at bay. So a surveyor, when you draw a map, never goes out in rain, right? They wait for the rain to stop. So what we work with as designers is a fair weather landscape, is a fair weather landscape. So by making this our reality, we have made rain, we have made, we have made uh, evaporation, we have made clouds, all visitors. So we, have, we now have a residence and we have migrants. So the rain comes, visits us and goes. Whereas if you look at the colonized version, they live with rain. And so that sense of actually of something coming and going doesn't exist. You are immersed in, 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 in wetness. And so it becomes a completely different notion of time. And that comprehension, and I'll, I'll come to in a, later, in a later project. There's another understanding of this now is, as two modes of, two modes of designing. In the drain imagination, you have a geographic surface, you have a land-water division, you know, you have 
a fair weather and you have weather events that are contained, you know, to the cyclone, to this, to that, you know, I mean, the rest of it, the tornadoes thing. And so you can, there's, there's a sense of control of these, of these events over here, you know, and, and a land surface division. On the other hand, you don't have a, you don't work with a plan imag imagination, you work with a section imagination between clouds and aquifers, you know, so you work with a hydrologic depth. So here you have a geographic surface, there you have a, hydro a hydrologic depth. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that geography is the language of colonialism. It is the discipline that allows for colonization. Whereas hydrology allows for this engagement of wetness that is studying. So we work with hydrology and geography, and they're two very different grounds. You know, and we must appreciate, we must appreciate that. And then in that section, we work between high grounds and low grounds at some point. You know, and that's where we that's where we live. We don't see an earth's surface. We just work with high ground and low ground. So here you have, you know, two modes of two modes of habitation illustrated, you know, in 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 section. So there you have a river. You know, think of that as the Mississippi within lines. You you build the lines into levees, contain it so that land is free. I mean, that's the classic model that we all work with. Whereas over here you have the Native American mounds, and this is what we saw. Actually, in Bogota, you know, the ancient Muiscas, mu uh, uh, who are the indigenous people of that, of that region, built these high grounds and low grounds for agriculture. So it's interesting, some of the students when you were there were describing these as canals. I said they're not canals. They're just low grounds. Canals has a directionality and a flow imagination. This is a low ground. It has a soaking imagination. And so, so it becomes a very different system that operates with, with gradients, and you've already sort of seen that. Um, so there are these weapons of colonization that have been overlooked by historians. And I would think that as designers, we need to bring it to the fore. And that is the surface and the line. They are our weapons of colonization. They are ways by which we have divined the river. And I want to get into that. When I talk about a surface, by the way, I'm talking about a, about a geometric element a geometric element that has length, breadth, but no depth. Proclus, who, who, uh, who wrote a commentary on Euclid's geometry, described the surface as a shadow. He says the shadow has no depth. You know, it's a very interesting uh, definition of, of, of surface, but it's a pure idea. So you can't talk about a surface as something that is, that, that is you know, innate in everybody. Not everybody sees a surface. Just think about it, that if I had to talk to an indigenous person who's not gone to school or anybody who's not gone to school and learn geometry or geography, you know, and say that, you know, there's, there's something in the earth, you know, here, they'll understand. But if I say there's something below the earth's surface, I say below what? Below a surface? That means there's something that you're seeing as an object that over there and that you're looking below it. So just think about that. I mean, it's not something that is evident. And then the line, the line is a breathless length. That's how Euclid defined it. So when you think of a line of trees or you think of a, of a line that is a gesture or you think of the line that I draw in section, those are not, you know, those are not the original line. The line that, that sets this off is a line with no breadth. Just it's only, only length. Again, a pure idea. It's a mathematical idea, not a reality that is perceivable. So there are people in the world who don't see lines and don't see surfaces necessarily. So this is a process of creation of the surface that we all take for granted. This is the colonizer imagination, you know? So you start with wetness that is everywhere, you know? I mean, and, and, and this, sounds, this may sound even biblical to some extent, but then you have, you put a surface to separate wetness above from wetness below, because now you have a surface that I can then manipulate. I can send water where I want to send it. I can, I can do so much with it, actually. It's, it's ingenious, actually, as a design intervention. And then I divide the, the, the surface between, between dry land and, and, and wet water so that ultimately I have water somewhere. So from wetness everywhere, I arrive at water somewhere. You know, this is, this is the first act of design that we all ignore. So we want to bring this now to everyone's attention. You know, that this is, as designers, this is what we first do. So when a surveyor goes out, he lays out the surface. And there's a reason why it's called a map, what they produce, a map. Map is mapa. Mapa comes from, you know, Latin for tablecloth. So you put a tablecloth. So that's what you do on the earth. You lay out a cloth. 
So where do I go? Below the anthill? Above the anthill? Under the marsh? Over the marsh? Below the mountains? Over the mountains? How do I lay out the surface? So there was a time in which they went below the mountain. The mountains were considered sores on the body of the earth, you know, until the 1600s. So all medieval maps just have the elevation of mountains. They don't have a mountain that is drawn in plan. So, so, so this becomes, I mean, an interesting articulation, a deployment uh, of surface and line toward, toward the colonization of water. That's what we are doing. We have changed wetness to water. So this is the first colonization before you can you colonize human beings or you do this with. So this is, the, this is, this is what has happened actually to the, to the Magdalena River in Colombia. It began as this when, uh, when Rodrigo Bastidas, you know, in 1501, went past over there and sort of named this the Magdalena. So you had this first drawing, you know, in the, in the 1500s, and then look at it evolve until you can, you grip the entire surface. And then you grip the earth. You know, we colonize the entire earth now as a surface. The water is controlled. Now I ask you, if water is, is having a Me Too moment, isn't this what we should be looking at a little more critically, you know, and asking, how did we arrive at this? How did we allow this to happen? You know, and so why have we bound water in this, in this, in this way? Um, so I want to focus on just one thing. I mean, and that is uh, river literacy. I'm not sure why I get this. Uh, I can move this. Uh, anyway, uh, it just happens to be right on that word. Anyway, so river literacy. It's a, now there's an understanding. Now, once, once you have a surface and line, we talk about literacy as text and, you know, the verbal literacy, but nobody thinks of a visual literacy. When we, use, when we use the line and the surface, we are actually exercising a literacy that has been ignored uh, by and large. And so we need to bring this to the fore. But if I look at a river, a river flows as a line does. You know, if I talk about a river that floods, it's because I erase the line. And if I think of the river as a source, it is because every line has a starting point, you know? So point, you know, if I talk about the, uh, a point of flow and, uh, and, 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 and erasure, it's coast, source, and flood. Oops, it's not moving now. Ah, yeah. Now, this raises three questions. River literacy raises three questions that are, I think, very significant. And that's what Ross of Red to, led to the, to the book I wrote on called The Invention of Rivers. One is wetness is everywhere. Why do we see water somewhere? I mean, that is a question that I've you know, sort of been talking about. The second is precipitation falls everywhere. Why do we see rivers starting in points? I mean, just think about it. I mean, people have been chasing this point for so long in the Nile, the Ganges, the Mississippi. They've been looking for this one point where the river begins. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, it must be so childish, isn't it? You know, I mean, to, to be chasing a point at the end of a line. You know, it's precisely because they're thinking line. And the third one is flood, is water crossing a line. Why do we see flood as natural? This is a very serious question. And I think it has led to really what I would consider criminal activity on the part of designers. You know, that people, I mean, particularly nomads, have used you know, places you know, as, as habitats in their, in their movements. Today, they have been drawn out as rivers. This is a place of water and nothing else. You know, and you say, why? You know? I mean, so you define it, and then when it floods, you then say, okay, this entire space, now you have a floodplain. So you have a floodplain, you have a flood pulse. I mean, ecologists live by these terms, but what is it? It's water crossing a line that I have drawn. In the first place, who drew it? You know, so there's a there's a whole you know artistic enterprise prior to science that has not been questioned. So this is this is where design begins. It is prior to science. So I wrote this uh, this book, Invention of Rivers. I mean, and it's interesting. You you challenge rivers. You you challenge civilization. You challenge everything. You know, and it's, it's very hard for me to have a conversation now you know, with anybody, you know, only because what happens with this? I mean, you think about, you think about the river, you think of the contradictions that I just, just spoke of. How do you actually become comfortable with contradictions like this? It is because you construct reality in a way to reinforce these contradictions as normal. 
you know so that is what that is what history has done that's what philosophy has done that is what so many fields have done they've co constituted a reality to reinforce you know a contradiction really i mean or, or let's just say in this particular case a design act the design of a river the invention of the line and the invention of the surface i won't go into them I mean, there was a part that deals with the ideas you know that uh, you know like the source of rivers go, you know, is reinforced by the notion of, of the Garden of Eden and Paradise. It's a beautiful, I mean, I really enjoyed, you know, the, the kind of exploration that this book took me on, um, you know, in, I mean, it led me to Herodotus, the Nile, the history of the Nile, the Danube, and, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a beautiful richness to it. I'm just going to touch on the Ganga. So it's generally about rivers, but particularly about the Ganga, and it sort of makes the point, the Ganga, Many people think about the Ganga as a, as a river. Um, what I want to suggest is that Ganga's reign, Ganges is a river, and the Ganges that is, that is defined you know, between two lines goes back to Alexander the Great of three, you know, 300 BC. And he comes to India from the, you know, from the Nile. He's carrying the idea of the Nile. And he, when he crosses the, the Himalayas and comes into India, he thinks he's at the head of the Nile. You know, the, he's found the source of the Nile. Uh, but he's really walked into this mess. That he cannot comprehend. He cannot. He cannot put water between two lines in the monsoon. The monsoon being this fantastic wind that comes in, you know, carrying this wetness that's so profound and profuse. So what you see that happening in Pakistan, you know, the last year where the the Indus was was all over the place, it wasn't a flood. This is how Alexander saw it. He saw the Indus like that as a as a spread of hundreds of miles of wetness. It wasn't contained in any, any line, but he set about containing it. So what we have now is this. He's lasted only two years, but we've had this gradual moving from, from Ptolemy's map up here to our, our current situation where water has been gradually over 2,000 years contained between lines. That is what colonization is. You know, It is about drawing the lines of the river so that you're created from a wetness, created a drainage. Uh, system and you've educated people into a drain imagination. So this is the this is the Ganga and the Ganges. They're used synonymously. You know, this is seen as the Sanskrit version of the English uh, Ganges, or the Ganges is seen as the English version of the Sanskrit Ganga. We see this as rain. That is a river, and the two don't speak to one another uh, at all. But what we have now is a river imagination that has been constructed in the mountains, that has been constructed in the plains, that has been constructed in the delta. So the Bengal Delta where Shubru comes from, uh, you know, was this mush that has been made into a field of islands, you know, with levees. So when you can't hold a line, what you do is you build a levee and then the line is held, you know. So, so much of this is constructed, you know, in order to hold the map, you know. So when they talk about the map preceding territory, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, to some extent, it is worked that way. And so the mountains, I mean, which is this vast Himalayan mountains, has come down to these few rivers that come off, you know, where people have sort of explored and said, that's the source of the Ganges. This is the source of the thing, you know, you say, I mean, just think about it, you know, I mean, it goes into a million, million, you know, sort of branches. Why do we choose one point, you know? But the result is this, that we have identified now over 2000 years, a spine of civilization that we all anchor on and take for granted. But that spine of civilization is also a drain of civilization. The Ganges is one of the most polluted, 10 most polluted rivers in the world. It's got no life in it at all, you know, except people who want to bathe in it at their own risk. I mean, it's, it's just sewage and, uh, and, industrial, and industrial waste. What we have created is an object. I mean, think about it. I mean, if some of you are familiar with Hercules' 12, uh, 12 labors, you know, when Hercules was asked to clean the stables of King Orgeus, what did he do? He took the river Alpheus, literally, and used it like a hose pipe. Now, how would he do that? He drew two lines, held the water between two lines, moved it, and then... So when we build a dam, we need those two lines. When we build a bridge, we need those two lines. We need to contain the Amazon before we can build a dam. That's why Amazon doesn't have a dam on it. It actually has all the channels that are built off it, and then you dam the channels, you know? So... But this is what you do, actually, with the line. You've created an object of control. And then you've created a being. So I just found this in a school in Delhi, you know, public school, you know, save a life, uh, you know, adopt a tree, adopt an animal, adopt a river. 
So today we're talking about riverhood, we're talking about granting rivers rights. This is the ultimate victory of colonialism. You know, wherein you, 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 you say that this is an indigenous idea, it's not necessarily an indigenous idea. It is now a way of, of, of enforcing the colonial mindset. So what you have, what, what, what people worshiped at one end, you know, was this rain that fell everywhere. They did not have any boundaries. They've created a river, you know, and that is the Kummela, which is a festival where you know, millions come to the banks of the river. That is an ecological disaster. People didn't do that. They found rain wherever they found rain if they wanted to worship Ganga or, you know, and do their, you know, put the ashes in, 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 uh, in the water, et cetera, et cetera. They did it wherever they were. They did not have to go to a river, but now they all do. So, you, you know, so this is, this is something that is, 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 is a process of, of creation. And then you have this, where the surface and line is in trouble. I mean, and this is not just India. I mean, you think of the fights that are happening over river waters, you're finding, you know, you, 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 the pollution that is happening in the river waters. I mean, think of Bangladesh, India, think of Indus, and I mean, the India and Pakistan, think of, I mean, the many international disputes over river waters, you know, and so what you have, you know, is, is, is this uh, also the search for a source. I mean, we were caught in that the Himalayan tsunami in 2013, um, Anu, I, and our, our daughter, and uh, getting out of the Himalayas in that, I mean, the army had to rescue us and we were, you know, in a shelter for, for a week. But uh, we couldn't get out because, because the, you know, little rain had just destroyed it. And these people who are, have taken over the Himalayas now, believing that the line contains rivers, you know, and settling on these things and just getting washed off, you know. So, I mean, so this is, and then the sadness of it all is that you blame rain for the disasters. So we are blaming rain now, you know, so for rain from being a source is becoming, is becoming the, the enemy. Um, so is this climate change? I say no. This is not necessarily climate change. I mean, if everybody there is talking about this time. This is not climate change. This is a bad design paradigm to begin with. This is, this is a way by which we have framed water in order to fail. Just to take you through one project on what this, what this really means in sort of shifting the imagination, this is Bombay. Bombay is an island. So you know, we talk now about two, two ways. Um, as a colonizer, I think as a colonizer, I think as a colonized. I think in terms of a drain imagination, I think in terms of a rain imagination. So a drain imagination tells me this, that Bombay is a city on a river, I mean, on the, on the sea, on, the, on a coastline. In a rain imagination, Bombay is in the monsoon. It's in the monsoon wind that comes from the southwest and is, then the coast is open to it. So to the colonizer, Bombay is an island. You know, so it's framed like this. You notice that the sea has never, has never anything to say in a map because the sea doesn't speak from above. A sea speaks in section. Whereas over there, you see, so one is called, by the way, let me clarify this. This is called Bombay and that is called Mumbai. This is how the British addressed their, their place, which they owned since 1661. Uh, so, you know, this was their place in the, in the east, Bombay. So they called it the island city. Whereas over there, Mumbai is in an estuary. An estuary is between rain and tide, very much like how we saw Norfolk um, as between rain and tide. So I know someone's interested in the drawings here, but, uh, but uh, this is really opening up a sectional imagination versus a plan imagination. So an island is driven by a plan imagination, line between land and water, between land and water, land and sea, et cetera. And that is open. You know, an estuary is between rain and tide, which is much more an open, an open ground. When you think of islands, and most planners work with Bombay like this, as an island city, you think of islands within islands. You're working with spatial land uses you know, residential, commercial. And this is the way you try to control the indigenous populations who are never controllable because they lived like that. They lived on a section of gradient. You know, every space was open. So their bazaars, their maidans, their, you know, I mean, all kinds of the talaos all operated on a gradient system. So why don't we understand them on, the, on, on, on Asturian terms rather than on island terms? You know, you get a very different different reading. So time plays a very different role here. And, and you begin to see people live by practices, not by land uses. So a drain imagination, the moment Bombay floods, and it floods every year, 
you know, you have this, the drain imagination kicks in. You say, well, let's contain the water. Let's get the water out as soon as possible. What we say is soak, hold. That's the way in which a rain imagination encourages you to, to move in, you know, move towards soaking, towards holding. So that is why we called it soak, Mumbai in an estuary versus, you know, the island city. And we did an exhibition of this and, and so on. So, so here you have, you know, immediately when you have a drain, then you have these fancy river fronts that designers run to, you know, I mean, this is a drain. You know, literally, I mean, 17 kilometers long, you know, a sewage canal, they're thinking of wonderful landscapes like this, you know, where you have, you know, riverfront developments. So, so, you know, everywhere, you can start, I mean, in India, this is something that is doubly useful because the river is also a sacred entity now, you know, recognize a sacred entity. So people want rivers, so they're creating rivers. And over there, I mean, this is what we see it as. I mean, it's about it's about holding systems. It's about uh, it's about facing drought as much as facing as facing rain. So we did uh, we did a whole lot of projects over there rather than a master plan. I'll just take you quickly through this thing. So we start off with this. You know, how do we actually approach the approach a situation in section? And so we started with a walk, and we identified actors in a walk. So these are three projects, the three fourths. You know, and they happen to have three fourths. I mean, this is a remarkable. You know, the two thousand families are living in this, you know, illegally in a fort. But it's ingenious architecture. You know that if you if you go in there, you you you'll you'll discover it. But there are all kinds of different lands, non-contiguous landscapes that are sort of constructed in here to call out to call out actors. But actors include flamingos, include the mangroves, include people. You know, and all all kinds of. Uh, we drew sections. Through this, through this uh, photo walk, that related in part to where we were in in terms of in terms of location, but also related to the sequencing of photographs, and we identified the actors again. We devised notational systems based on time, rather than space based on time. Because many people said, "Oh, this is Bombay. There's no space at all here. What can you do?" We said, "No. In in time, there's a lot of space." So when time comes first, you have this. so these are material and notational systems by which time operated, you know, in in uh, in Mumbai. And so we worked out calendars, you know, schedules, uh, you know, that in in because uh, an estuary, an estuary in imagination operates by time. So you have migrant fishes, migrant birds, you know, all that that sense of movement is a very different. Um, it sets up a very different challenge for designers. Uh, to engage rather than just a map and plans. And then we did interventions in these, in these things. So you can see the transformation of the photo walk with these interventions. And they were small interventions. They were not necessarily big water holding systems, biotic cleansing systems, and so on. OK, so I want to just touch on the ocean, ocean of Rain, which is a project that we're working on, working on now. I mean, it's been on the it's been on the drawing board for a while now, but it challenges the very act of representation. So while we have been looking at representation for a number of years, what we're asking now is who are we to represent? Can we engage or can we can we can we demonstrate through analogy the you know a, a process by which you know we look at place as engaged by people. So we engage paper as someone engages place. But again, it's these two languages. Every word that we speak, and this, and we are looking at India in particular, speaks in two ways with these two imaginations. So how do we actually begin to navigate these two, uh, two imaginations? So here, we're looking at India and Sindhu in the same manner that we looked at Ganga and Ganges in the invention of rivers. So India is a geographic surface. Sindhu is an ocean of, an ocean of rain. And these are again used synonymously. India is often seen as Sindhu. Sindhu is seen as, you know, as the Sanskrit version of, of, of India. And very often we think about India as the land that was colonized by the British, before the British, the Portuguese, the, you know, and so on and so forth. We say, no, India is not the colonizer. It's not the colonized. India is the colonizer. And that colonization continues today. In fact, it, some of the some of the policies that the government of India, you know, linking India's rivers, doing things like that, actually more colonial than the British, you know. So if you just think about think about these two as 
as places that are that call for a different each calls for a different imagination. So here you have just to, to give you a couple of examples. This is Varanasi on the on the Ganges, which is seen as a city on the banks of the Ganges, and that is a Janpad on the on the Ganga. Janpad is another term for high ground. It literally means foothold of the people. Yeah. So you have a foothold of the people, and here you have um, uh, a city on a on a river bank. But this is how the city is seen as a riverfront. So if you go as a tourist to Varanasi, this is what you might see. And you would, of course, go only in, you know, November, December, January, you know, nice weather. Right? And then the rains come. So this is two times of the year. The one on the left is taken after the monsoon in August. The one on the right is taken in December after the monsoon waters have receded. Same place. The Ganges rises 60 feet. It puts all that under. So what happens after is this. So this is before the tourists come. The month of October, September, October is spent cleaning the idols and the thing, the you know, feet of mud that's coming down from the Himalayas. With all that deforestation, this is where the stuff is, this is where the stuff settles, you know, before it goes to things. So if you had to go after, this is what you might see. You might see a wetness that is that is that is evident. Um, that's not quite evident in December, January. But then you also notice something else, that this is just the front of the city. What about the back? You know? And you realize that there's a wonderful system of holding tanks of rain that have been destroyed over the centuries. A system that is on a Janapad, that is a sequencing of rain holding systems. And you see that section down below that highlights some of these tanks. And all these tanks were destroyed by the British in favor of a city on a river. So you destroyed a rain imagination in order to construct a river imagination. So what you have is this, you know, a river and a rain imagination that reside together. It's getting late, so I think I'm just going to go very quickly. We, there are other things that we, you know, we take to be streets that are much more, you know, wetness systems. So we understand them very differently in wetness as opposed to understanding them as the land water, as land water systems. But I want to take you to what we generally describe as a desert, you know, which is the tar. So the British saw it as a desert. You know, and so you have it over here, parts, you know, the desert, very little known to Europeans, but nobody went there. Now, they discovered after they, you know, they call it a desert, then you discover that there are about eight to 10 million people living there. Now, would they call themselves, their, their home, a desert? Desert means left waste, desertum. You know, so this is, I mean, desert, the word desert should be banned from the, from the dictionary actually, because the people have ways of living there that we totally are, are, are ignorant of. But when you see it as a desert, this is what you do. You bring canals and then you grow rice in a desert, you know? And so now this is again a river system that is emerging, 
in the desert. You know, so moving Indus waters into into the into this uh, into this desert. Yeah, but even before they built the canal systems, you have a tentative understanding of what they call a river, the Luni. Okay, so you put this between two lines, you know, and then you talk about flood, and these are these are places that carried rain from that fell in in the in in the higher ground to lower ground. So what began as a tentative marking has taken on a very serious, you know, uh, complexity today. We went down this, and this is what we saw. So it starts with these lakes, and then you go through these fantastic, you know, so sheep herders come in there. You know, dyers come in there, flamingos come in there, salt, salt mining is happening over there, fairs are happening, you know, until you reach the salt, these, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Western salt fields. It's just different wetnesses that, that we engaged right through. Where's the water? There's no water. So, we engaged, we engaged wetnesses through this, through this uh, landscape. And then we bring the two together to, to create, I mean, what, what is this about? I mean, we really inhabit a ground between water and wetness, between a rain imagination and a drain imagination, between time and space, you know? So these, are, these drawings are seven feet, you know, high and, you know, and, uh, worked with screen printing in this case, and in the case of Varanasi, it was staining. Then you have this concept of an oran, which people love to see as an oasis in the desert. It is a place that is, you know, a source of, a source of drinking water. It has these fantastic trees, um, and uh, it's held kind of sacred by, by people. You're not allowed, you're only allowed foraging. You're not allowed to, um, to cultivate anything there, but they bring their cattle and, uh, and uh, and other things to it, um, but it is a remarkable. It's a remarkable. You know, it's it's not. I mean, they want to see it as a grove. They want to put a fence around it. You know, they want to see it as a leopard spot, which is how the Romans saw an oasis in the Sahara. But what we saw was just a concentration, a concentration and expansion of wetness, with fantastic array of birds that come from Europe that come from Africa, that come from, 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 uh, from the Middle East, you know, and from other parts of, other parts of India. Yeah? And they, they present a place that is, that is open to the world, not closed like an oasis, working on gradients rather than working with finite dimensions. You know? So you have something that is quite, that is quite fantastic and unique as a, as a place. So I we distinguish this from you know landscape versus wet, versus wetness. Landscape meaning fair weather landscape. Then one last uh, thing, and that is the street in Jodhpur, which is a which is a sort of called a city over there. And uh, you might see this if you had to walk down this uh, this street. It began with two reservoirs, and it ends with this wonderful wonderful tank. You know, where these Olympic divers, by the way, did some ad, which is, which is on the web. It was quite fantastic to see. And this is called a gully. Now, a gully is an eroded landscape. You know, it's eroded by rain. And the British loved the term because they could use it for the Indian street, you know, where values are eroded, you know, civilization is a little low, et cetera, et cetera. So you could, you know, gully was a perfect term for things like that, right? But um, what we discovered was that this is a gully is a fantastic place actually, wherein you have multiple activities going on. So you can have a cricket match, you have a you know place of worship, you have you know a festival going being celebrated, you have a wedding being celebrated, and they're not happening in different places. They're happening in the same place actually. So when a cricketer is 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 playing a stroke and a car goes by, he modifies the stroke. You know, so he's constantly inventing the game, like you're constantly inventing the ceremony. You know, or the or the religious ceremony. I mean, so that kind of innovation and adaptation that uh, that occurs with a gully is is an amazing uh, is an amazing thing. And then you discover that the gully is also a place of wetness. There are these reservoirs underneath which you don't see on the street that 
and it is a, it is a run of rain from the reservoirs down to the to the tanks so how do you engage a gully as a place of rain and wetness as opposed to a geographic street you know where you want to design a traffic system first before you allow for any other other activities so with that i just want to conclude you know with with a thought here you know and and that what we really need you know in the face of all these issues that confront us you know that we tend to see as climate change and i'm not denying climate change but we must just see climate change as a, as a symptom and not a and, and and not the problem what is the issue that we have at hand is the need for a new imagination that is section driven and that is wetness driven so this is what we call a wet a wet imagination and i just found these two pictures as i was preparing for this talk you know in africa where there's a clearing of forest by a woman who was taking charcoal in the congo i mean in our day and age to see something like this i mean how terrible can it be i mean it really encapsulates what you know the kind of issues that we face today and that's germany but for once we have you know a kind of leveling out of the world you know wherein we're beginning to see that it doesn't really matter where you are what we need is a wet imagination thank you thank you right so thank you um, we have a little discussion first, and then, of course, want to engage with the audience as we do this typically here. Um, sorry for this round table um, has a strict form. Um, yes. Less of a field. Um, to, I guess it's a clear indication of a design object in the paradigm of eye landing. So we're tabling away here. Um, but what's it's fascinating. Thanks for shifting the mind. Um, very philosophical, I thought. Um, and for me, the discussion of the line, I, I read Derrida and the Deridian problem of the line um, as being in the moment you look at the line, you do not see anymore what it divides. And in the moment you look at the form that it inscribes, you can't see the line anymore. And I think you shifted it, however, in a total different domain, linking it to the um, also the climate change topic and I want to start there maybe because I think this is a lot on everybody's mind right now but the way you described and I want to say two things first I was a little scared that you said there is no climate change and no no I, and, I, I, and I you, didn't say that yeah yeah, yeah. so I, this was my first interpretation but then you of course came home and says no no but what's fascinating about it that the implication of what we consider right now climate change implications are a product of us drawing a strict line between something that never had a line like that. And if we would think differently, as I understand you, we would have not think of it as such a dramatic problem. That's my one takeaway. And the second takeaway, it seems so, that much of the problems that we experience today as climate change come out of us misunderstanding or misusing the environment that was given to us, or we're actually part of by radically eradicating the natural conditions of cyclicality and by taking resources away and therefore clearing in order to make clear definitions of here's that versus here's that. And if we wouldn't think that way, which seems to be a Western, maybe informed, almost mechanized thinking of things, then we may not be in as much trouble as we find ourselves today. Um, so that's my takeaway. Is that a too much of a no. pitch or is that? Yeah. So in other words, you wanted to change our minds? Uh, you, you're okay. Yeah, yeah, I think Yeah, and I, I've got my, I think I'm still wired here. Uh, no, I think that, you know, this is, this is the, the argument that we're making today is that as designers, we tend to see things very differently from the way it has been presented to us by philosophers and by by orientalists and by you know anthropologists and others who have tended to divide the world you know that you know if 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 i look at the indigenous versus versus uh, versus the you know uh, let's say the, the colonizer or if i look at uh, west versus east or you know in those kind of old uh, divisions one tends to one tends to romanticize one side you know, and uh, but when one looks at you know design agency of the line and 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 call that out as something that 
that calls for admiration and calls for calls for, for looking at the way in which we have been educated one begins to see that that it is it's it's not about either or but it is about the cohabiting i ask myself how is that i can i can handle both these paradigms in one so it's not like i'm looking at indigenous people over there i have an element of indigeneity in me you know as much as i have the colonizer in me you know and that's the way in which uh, you know uh, i mean to me it, it merits a certain admiration and a certain way of embracing something by which i can work so when i'm looking at say norfolk and i'm looking at a line between land and water that has been made a levy i know that in the short term i have to i have to build a levy to keep out the sea but can i design in such a way that that levy will become an independent high ground so i work to change the imagination so in work with school children i work with uh, work with administrators i work with government officials and i then say i mean is it possible for us to not think of land water systems but to think of high ground low ground systems and can i take this levy that i built to protect myself in one paradigm and make it an element in another paradigm in the long term so in one case i'm working for the 50 year period in the other one i'm working for the 500 year period you know and so i believe that the challenge for design is in this temporal distinction and and holding both frameworks in one you know and this is where i mean i mean say someone like a reader who draws attention to line draws attention to folds i mean uh, a deluge drawing attention to folds and this thing at the surface they don't see the design agency in it actually you know they don't see the invention of these elements these geometric elements and that is the that is where i feel our contribution becomes really really serious you know as designers so let me push you a little bit on the imagination that you have presented on wetness which uh, you contrast with the other imagination which is land right now we cannot really imagine wetness without land or imagine land without wetness so uh, the question is can we even think about democratizing the process so rather than thinking of one imagination versus the other imagination can we think about the two actually negotiating with each other to find a common ground the <laughs> land imagination and the wetness imagine i think that's an excellent question you know i mean and and what i would say is there is no common ground and that is and that has been the mistake that we are making actually is that and to navigate the two systems as independent systems without asserting a common ground is i think what we need to do so i look at the world i mean as these two places two two that are constantly diverging and in fact i encourage my students i say what does it mean to think of seeds of change and i would choose my seeds so that i get divergent conditions rather than convergent ones so until now very often we have always worked like this towards so i can work democratically towards divergence you know and so i would say let's not try and bring these together remember and this is the advantage of them being a being an inhabitant of both i can think one so i can look at that drawing that i showed of columbia water system and forest and say that's a nonsense drawing but that's one half of me speaking to the other half because i work with those drawings you see and so i say okay can i you know i'm not trying to bring the two together what i'm just merely saying is this imagination is driving me towards this this is the thing you know can i work independently in the two and then you know see how this operates here how this operates here but not necessarily as common so i start with i mean so in the case of the levy that i that i design i might think about it as a kind of common ground but i would refrain from that i would say how will i work the process and in this case the democratic process you know how to change this from a system that works this and that the two sides of a line i mean the the divide to high ground low ground that way you know so that kind of a this thing is a, it I, and i don't want to get into rupture and things like that no to me as a designer it's a very simple situation it's when you theorize this thing that you get into a bit of nonsense you know that thing so i i 
to me, that's the limits. It's the limits of theory and philosophy. Can't go there. Yeah. So I have a question for you. When did it start with the thinking? Because there must have been a moment that you were, quote unquote, proper educated, reading your plans, and then something appeared, radicalized you, <laughs> seems. Um, you read a lot of philosophy, maybe. Um, so because I, I personally went through this experience as well, being extremely rationally trained. And then I read Gartari Deleuze in this case, um, yeah. you know, um, deterioration, reterialization, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm just curious, when did yeah. it happen? And then I guess once it happened, you cannot think differently, right? It's like a different yeah. world and mindset. So, but how did it come about? Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's a good question. I think, I mean, I don't know if I can point to any, any thing. I mean, Venki maybe will be able to tell me when I did it. Um, <laughs> the oldest friend but, on earth, as we heard. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, the way I look at it, I mean, and this is, I learned so much from reading Henry David Thoreau's essay, Walking. I don't know if any one of you have read it, but uh, his essay, Walking, is beautiful because one of the points that uh, is often made with that essay is that, uh, you know, he says, in wildness is the preservation of the world, in wildness is the preservation of the world. And, uh, of course, environmentalists turn it to in wilderness. Wilderness and wildness are not the same thing. Um, but, um, but when you read that essay, what is amazing about it, you know, it's about, it's about how you walk, how you walk, Never in the same way, never in the same way. So he talks about walking as not an exercise that you take. Walking is not about getting from here to there. But, uh, but walking, ultimately, if you had to read between his lines, is about getting lost. It's about getting lost, not to find one's way, you know, but to make one's way. So when I look at walking, I see a design manifesto. You know, and, and I often give it to my students and say that, you know, I mean, Henry David Thoreau was a designer. I mean, what he was telling us is that, you know, I mean, how do you then design lostness? So Shubro saw me in my lost phase, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I'm still lost. I mean, and I love being lost because then you can make your way, you know, and, and, and this constant making way. So I really don't know. I have an answer to that question. I mean, I just drift. I mean, and I think mm -hmm. most of us actually drift. I mean, I think Henry David Thoreau drifted. Uh, and uh, he was encouraging us all to drift. And uh, so, you know, I don't work with a before and an after, and I, I, I just work with a kind of eternal now, you know, and uh, so living in that kind of moment is actually quite beautiful. And I think that that is really what Henry David Thoreau is asking us all to do, you know, is to, is to live in the moment and, uh, and not, so you don't, even if I walk the same geographic path, the same thing on a map, it's different every day and I'm making my way and not finding my way, you know? And so how do you construct that condition? I have no idea, but, um, but I think that's a designer. So uh, tell me, did your training and planning somehow turn you away from it or, or did you find anything of value? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think everything is a value. Really, everything's a value, you know? I mean, it's just a matter of running toward or running away. I mean, and <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't, I really don't, uh, like I say, I, I don't judge, uh, I don't judge uh, my own past. And, uh, and uh, I think it is, and, and this is what I would tell Anu, and we would have discussions constantly on this when our daughter allowed it, you know, allowed us to have a discussion. Uh, you know, she at some point realized that the moment she gave us breathing room, we would keep talking about our work. So she's, you know, and when she learned to talk, she would just talk continuously and not, you know, not allow us to speak. Uh, but um, but we would constantly discuss this uh, this this uh, issue, and we sort of, and like I said at the start, just being very thankful to uh, to a string of inquiry that has remained consistent, you know, and. Um, and so much of this has come in, you know, sort of fed me from the side and I cannot deny it. I mean, I would say, you know, Shubru, my conversations with you, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, to understand <laughs> no, the gathering, the gathering of a biryani. I mean, you know, I mean, I think everything sort of adds to it. I mean, and I think it's, but I think it is the holding on to that inquiry that has sort of persisted, you know, I mean, and I feel that's the only thing that one can really say, I mean, is to whatever one is doing to sort of persist in that in that line and we're just we're just fortunate i mean and frankly you know when we did the bombay project no one was really listening to us you know i mean and then you know suddenly climate change came into the picture so 
I mean, and and here, you know, Inge, I mean, I I would, uh, you know, I don't say I don't, you know, that there's no climate change. I do believe it is, but you know, I just take it as a symptom. But um, but we were doing all this before climate change, you know. I mean, you think of the appropriate technology of Schumacher, and you think of you think of Gandhi's philosophy. I mean, much of it is coming back today in the name of climate change. It doesn't mean it never happened before, you know. So there's so much of regurgitation going on in the name of climate change that it sort of makes me. It bothers me a little bit, you know. I mean, you say, what are we learning here? We just moved from problem. So we just came out of, you know, poverty elevation and we jumped into sustainability. We came out of sustainability and we jumped into resilience. We come out of resilience and you jump into climate change. You know, I mean, let's not be so serious. Let's take this with a sense of humor, you know, and see, you know, that this is, that this is, that there is some amount of mischief in this as well, you know, as, as, as purpose. But the problem that we face is much larger than any one of these. And why do we move from problem to problem, flood to flood, drought to drought? That's a, this crisis-driven mode comes from this drain imagination, comes from river thinking, comes from surface thinking, you know? And, and maybe there's, you know, we have to learn some things from. So, I mean, I'm just coming back from Bogota, where we interacted with indigenous people you know, who are really coming into, the, and they're coming up with very innovative ideas in planning, like the care block. And they're bringing people in, you know, by measures of care, not by measures of space. So what we are going to be working on Columbia University is how do we make care the language of planning? So I'm not moving away from planning. I'm not moving away from thing. I mean, I really see these divisions as sort of, you know, I mean, we work across them. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't, we don't take them seriously at all you know i mean and i'm sure nobody here takes any of those divisions seriously right <laughs> i mean we, we all work across uh, the thing you know we're just marketing uh, you know within silos and uh, i think we just need to laugh at it you know after a point but uh, but yeah it's all part of the <laughs> the navigation i guess of life but i think maybe for the planning question if i looked at your way of not drawing a line, but looking at the survey as points and the trajectories back and forth um, and the kind of allowing and letting happening, I think would be an interesting question of how do you bring this into the planning realm, given yeah. the notation systems we have today, and how do you not only project into the future, which you suggest giving a temporality, but also mm -hmm. how do we, and I think this is your search, your continuous search in terms of the screens that you, you know, print layers, layer by layer, but also the whole different imaginary that comes with the different ways of mapping. Um, because it seems that our mapping techniques of the traditional planning and architecture and whatnot, we have, you know, the categorical ways, uh, impossible for you to we can't capture this way yeah. the everyday the cyclical um yeah. and that seems to be a key question how do we change our way maybe how to educate yeah. and how to imprint yeah. the ideas or the cyclicality how do we even acknowledge that and take that into consideration so yeah. this is when i say circular economy but that's also too stiff of a term because it is containing again as every crisis mode you describe tries just to capture it to packages again in order to find the right um equally contained measures probably to counter and i think what i heard today which i found fascinating is it is much bigger it's the ultimate mindset we have towards how we are as part of i would say uh wetness yeah. because the human body by the way is relatively wet um and you know, and we think of each other as individuals, undividable, but and yet we might be totally extended yeah. in a kind of super wet wetness um, where we're just dreaming of for security and hope for being sheltered and secured away of yeah. a separation line that doesn't exist. It's yeah. maybe an imagination that came to keep us sane. Yeah. Do you think what was what how did the line came into? into yeah. mind and into existence and then i guess it was cultivated um, yeah. throughout modernization but what do you think how did this whole idea of containment idea even the possibility yeah. that this wild dream to be able ever able to shelter something away came yeah. into being and i asked that of course also as an architect right yeah because 
the architecting the whole primitive hut idea is about yeah somewhat protecting yourself from the elements right and you suggest however allow them in understand the rhythms become really? part of it yeah elevate the land lower the yeah. land yeah. and just live with it in a way yes i mean I, I think that the kind of distinctions that we that we make in architecture really comes from um you know surface and line that 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 we trace back to the school of Miletus. So if you're familiar with the school of Miletus is a pre-Socratic pre -Socratic school uh, that was started by Thales, Thales of Miletus and Anaximander, his student, Anaximander, who was credited with the first world map. So, I mean, I write about this in the invention of rivers, but I'm exploring it more deeply actually for the ocean of rain, because in dealing with the surface, one has to comprehend that what these men did, I mean, it's fascinating to see actually how they did it. Like they went to Egypt, they asked one of the first scientific question, why does the Nile flood? But before they asked, why does the Nile flood? They actually put Egypt on a surface between two deserts, you know, and that surface then became a fixity on which they saw change. So water became the carrier of change. So they were looking at it pure science and as, a, as a scientific thing. So, so the surface and line came about as fixities in order to understand change. So you might have, for those of you who probably read the, read the, you know, this, uh, um, this pre-Socratic uh, world of Thales and, and how science emerged and um, Fuzika, which is the study of nature, physics, you know, I mean, it all emerged from this trying to comprehend change and attribute change to observational grounds rather than to mythical creatures, which is what, what was happening until Thales. So if I had to point to any starting point, actually, of surface and line, it is, it is this school in Miletus, which is in Turkey, you know, Asia Minor, uh, and, uh, and, and their comprehending of Egypt and the Nile. That was, the, that was their effort, you know, I mean, I think. And, and, uh, and I think it's just, I mean, if one is interested in that, I mean, it's just, I, I find it really fascinating because it, you know, it, if you read uh, Alfred North Whitehead, you know, which I was reading in Berkeley, uh, if you remember Shubru, Alfred North Whitehead's Process and Reality, because they're very interested in process. He writes over there that, you know, all of philosophy is a footnote to Plato. And what is interesting, I mean, in my understanding till now is that, you know, Plato was a footnote to the school of Miletus. Um, and, and, and philosophy is a footnote to geography. And, and so geography is the first discipline, actually, wherein you set the earth and the earth's surface and then found the line between land and water. And then, I mean, if you read Plato and if you read Aristotle, much of their understanding of philosophy, I mean, in the writing of it, is grounded on the earth's surface and, and, and the line. So it's a, you know, it is, it's something that needs to be, needs to be said, you know. So, well, I'm going to say it in the next term, in this uh, ocean of, Ocean of Rain uh, book, you know, uh, bring that out uh, about uh, out of it. But uh, but this there's uh, you know if you think of a Herodotus, for those of you who are landscape architects, Herodotus I consider to be the first landscape architect. I mean he's the one who articulated landscape like nobody else did actually. I mean and his reading of history, his reading of time, his reading of of place is so grounded on the earth's surface and and the articulation of place. Um, you know, and, and when I read the, you know, histories of landscape that just say that, you know, landscape comes from, you know, land and skip and, you know, and looking at dictionary and etymology, they just don't get it. You know, I mean, if you think of Herodotus as sort of uh, setting the ground for some of the things that we just take for granted, you know, we know him as a father of history, but I'm calling him father of landscape. How do you see the landscape and the way you view it, your imagination, affecting people and societies and the way societies are structured mm -hmm. and how would it be different if he had a different imagination? Well, that's to some extent what the, what the wetness imagination is counterposed to the landscape imagination. If you, if you think that the drain imagination is landscape imagination, actually, I mean, and so I consider the language of landscape to be the language of colonialism. Yeah, and uh, and landscape architects today as being the carriers of colonial, of colonialism without acknowledging it, so so they are the latter day colonizers.
So just think about it. I mean, I mean, I was in, you know, we did, uh, Columbia did a project in, in Addis Ababa. And there, the, there's a Chinese company that is actually building this, you know, this riverfront project. I mean, it is so out of place. I mean, and such a disaster. I mean, think of what they're doing in Pune. I mean, India is raining riverfronts. I mean, it's all being done by architects and landscape architects. You know, I mean, and you just, and it's absolutely inappropriate, you know, and disastrous, but they're just looking at it as real estate, you know, and uh, things. So we have to counter that pressure that is coming, you know, that is, that is coming there from, you know, with this, with this language of wetness that then begins to see not a river, but begins to see another whole ground of engagement by people who have been marginalized and, you know, and, and kept away from, from some of these, these projects. So these, this poverty persists outside of this. So we turn a blind eye with landscape to poverty by sending it elsewhere. And, you know, we turned a blind eye to nomads. You know, I mean, the Bedouins, the thing that we've seen, I, mean, I don't know if you've seen their rehousing in Mongolia, the rehousing, I mean, it's sad. I mean, you, we don't comprehend them be precisely because we don't have a framework for them. You know, we see them constantly in this paradigm of landscape and they don't, they don't live by landscape. They live by the terms of wetness. And so, you know, I just feel that they, it's, suddenly things come into play, into, into place if you had to just look at them with a completely new imagination. Say, oh, that's why they do this. That's what we have found in all our work. Um, I want to ask a last question and then turn it to the audience. So if somebody has a question, please come up to the microphone. Um, so my question is, Sandy, when you walked with me here um, entering, you said there is something like a New York gang. And it seems to be a gang um, that has been heavily um, affected and enabled yeah. um, through Sandy. And yeah. Sandy, if we're talking about effects of um, you know, water yeah. and wetness on yeah. large populations, um, Sandy was one remarkable moment uh, threatening yeah. Manhattan. Uh, yeah. you know, putting a whole quarter of Manhattan out of electricity for weeks or days yeah. at least, uh, and people trapped in a high rise is not coming down, et cetera, et cetera. But right. what, when you were referring, and you refer to Kate Orff, I think, and yourself and others, when you said that this new New York gang coming along, uh, for me, you are letters. You allow and let and enable, and that's your strategy for planning. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about this. What happened there and what do you do differently since <laughs> Sandy came by? And then yeah. also um, how much does it allow you more to be heard than previously? Uh, you know, this, I mean, if you, you know, you travel the world a little bit, you know, as uh, we are forced to do because we've come from elsewhere, you know, you begin to see that, uh, I mean, there's so much happening there and it's been happening for centuries. Nobody cares a damn. But when it happens to America, then boy, you know, suddenly there's a tension. And when it happens to New York, oh boy, you know, then everything, you know, comes alive, you know. So, so with that sense of, you know, uh, I, I sort of look at this with some humor, you know. I mean, in the efforts, actually, uh, the efforts with Sandy, you know, in the rebuild by design, while it achieved a lot, I think, you know, I mean, though it didn't, you know, not it realized except for Kate Off's projects, which was the one project that was without levy systems, you know, and uh, and you know, in our engagement with the Army Corps of Engineers, we've been, you know, they are smart people. I mean, they have worked with, you know, I mean, we've met the the strong the strong men, you know, and uh, thing, but we've also met the empathetic, you know, um, engineer who's looking for a way beyond levies. You know, looking for a new imagination. You know, asking us. You know, if there is another possibility. So when I saw the when I when I see many of the rebuild by design projects actually reside, you know, resorting to levy systems, you know, I say, oh boy. I mean, I said, Army Corps of Engineers is beyond levies, and here we have the designers catching up. You know, so I said something is wrong here. You know, in a thing, but uh, but there is a certain gathering of momentum i think that uh, sandy achieved i think and uh, with uh, with this focus on with the focus on on new york to some extent i mean our project on structures of coastal resilience you know which was also a rockefeller grant etc but you know sort of extended down the coast so you know so i mean i just i just i just see it as a as a kind of turning point 
by which designers have been brought into the discussion much more aggressively. Um, I just don't see enough of a shift in the language. And I think designers can do a lot more, you know? And, and uh, I mean, to some extent, what I've shared with you is, a, is, is that aspect that we can speak a different language. And, and I would really think that, and I, I'm in conversation with historians and anthropologists and people in the humanities. Um, and uh, the after tomorrow, I'm going to be in conversation with scientists uh, in, uh, you know, at the National Center for Biological Sciences, where I'm hoping to actually not just, not just speak about, you know, speak about ecology on a different ground, possibly, because it, it takes the surface for granted. I mean, does land proceed? you know, the way in which we have seen uh, science or does science, you know, I mean, I should say, does is land an element of nature or does nature follow from, from the construction of land or the assertion of land? You know, that's the, I mean, those kind of questions. I mean, is one side. I mean, that bringing that up with, with the, the humanity scholars and scientists is, is something that I, I believe that designers need to do. I mean, they, you need to lead I think you need to lead today in the face of in the face of climate change. We need to play a leadership role, not a follow up role. You know, to in order to uh, you know just sort of you know make levees more habitable kind of thing. Um, and uh, I mean, I wanted to say something else, but sorry, I lost my train of thought. I'll try to come back. But um, any questions from the audience? Do you want to come? I'm hard of hearing, so I hope I yeah. can. Uh, Thank you like, for the lecture. Um, so the paradigm you speak to, high ground, low ground, Sorry? the paradigm you speak to, high ground, low ground, um, sort of a state of dynamism, as opposed to thinking about things in a state of sort of static existence, implicates boundary and specifically property boundaries as sort of is a constructed category, right? Um, and I'm wondering, because so much of design work happens either with or against these legal fictions that we live every day of property, regimes, insurance, things that act across time, in time, but require the establishing of absolutes, something that you sort of call out as a, as a fictional category. I wonder if you can talk through um, some examples from your work where you found that the work has had to adapt or sort of uh, embody a particular modality to be in conversation with these sort of legal fictions? How do you operate against them or with them? How do you pull them into conversation? Um, some examples, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, you know, to tell you frankly, I mean, we've sort of opened conversations, you know, that have, um, you know, we've not had the opportunity of directing enough, I feel. Uh, and it's something that we need to sort of explore. Because what is challenged over here? I mean, if you had to just take one element, property that we face, uh, you know, everywhere, um, like in the case of Bombay, we were asked to take these projects to, you know, to realize these projects. But obviously, you know, I mean, much of what we did was a shift in the imagination, and we needed to take it to ground with with structural drawings, that kind of a thing. And uh, and uh, raising money for them was not was not very easy. And the difficulty that we had over there. I mean, it's not property related as much as as much as um, as much as I would say. Uh, how do you sell something like this to the public? So a bureaucrat, unfortunately, today everything is directed in absolute terms: land, water, clean, dirty. You know that kind of thing. So we couldn't tell them this, and what we want to do is just improve this. So we are working on a gradient. You just give us a you know unless you give us this entire system from mountain to sea you know, we can't realize this in itself. So giving us a middle thing and saying, you know, take this as a, as a, as a you know, project, you say it's doomed to failure, you know? So because, you know, unless you're, unless you're willing to allow us to show that we are taking something from there and improving it when it exits here, you know, that kind of a thing. That is so difficult, you know, it's so difficult. The notion of property, you know, the notion of property we are really up against. I mean, we were up against it in New Orleans, uh, you know, after Katrina and, uh, but where we can contribute in this case, I mean, and, and it is something that is a slow moving thing, is that there are a number of, a number of um, uh, systems 
like you know you have the Kaminidad system, you have uh, you know the Gangkari system, you've got uh, the Panchayat system. All these systems, ancient systems in various places, have all been grounded on land, and and uh, and that to me is a miscomprehension. And by opening up by opening up this this uh, hydrologic depth as the possibility as a as the place for them is yet to be is yet to be played out and i'm hoping that you know some anthropologists will take it and say that okay now this is it's not a an understanding of property shifting you know of a surface but it's understanding of property on the grounds of wetness you know and 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 relative practices and things like that so this has to be done you know really has to be done but uh, we have begun to I mean, I'm, I, I see the possibilities of it. Like, so even morality, you know, and uh, issues of law, what constitutes a being, a legal being, you know, things like that are also sort of open to question. How to move forward on it is something that, um, you know, we need to talk about it. But, but I just feel that by, by doing this, it has just opened up a horizon that nobody has actually engaged. Nobody has engaged, you know, at all. And uh, and so it's a very exciting exciting moment. But uh, but I think what you point to is really the difficulty. Is really you know everywhere. I mean we thought we think a lot about it. We think a lot about it. And and while I can understand how to shift a levee from uh, from you know from a boundary to a high ground to change property from you know from from a from a system a surface system to a to a depth system is something that is a thing. But I've got so many examples where I can consider this to be. It just makes much more sense to understand some of these uh, traditional systems hydrologically rather than even the medieval map has been misunderstood as a spatial, a spatial map when it is actually a hydrologic map. It's not a geographic map at all. But we say it is a hydrologic and we ridicule it as this meaningless stuff of medieval religions and you know, make it religious and things. It's nothing like that. It's actually hydrology. It's, uh, you know, so, so, yeah, so there's a lot there. You know, but the... I may follow up with you by, via email for some of these examples. Sorry? I may follow up with you via email for some of these examples if you're open to that. Sure, sure. I'd love that. Yeah, yeah. And if you can take on some of it, it'd be fantastic. <laughs> Do you want to come? Sorry, we don't have to come up with that. Yeah. No. Yeah. I just feedback on the question. So, um, what strategies do you have, or if you can recommend, for this uh, imagination of wetness? To, uh, for, for what? For this imagination of wetness. Yeah. Uh, to to take hold in our lives in this capitalistic society, where, mm. where everything is predicated on lines and you know, properties which are bound by lines. Yeah. And how do you? Or do you have any other? Um, and how do we communicate these this imagination to us? Yeah. Uh, you kind of answered that a little bit. Sort of, yes. <laughs> you know, but um, I mean, the way the way I, if I had to just sort of put the question in a, in, in perhaps a different in a, in a different frame, um, you know, I think that uh, what we need to what we need to do, I mean, and, and the thing is to focus on the particular. There's a lot of focus actually on the generic. And we have constructed the, I mean, like even, even elements of land, for example, property, uh, these have all become universals. They become universals. And what, uh, what we are pushing toward is actually the particular. So if I had to have any strategy, so it's like the Norfolk, you know, I mean, and if I had to get even more particular, I would, I would prefer that. You know, and in the case of, I mean, this is why, you know, that when we say, I mean, if I had to take the case of Bogota, you know, in the old days, we would do a master plan for the city, you know, and that, and they have done that. I mean, or even an, as an urban designer in a studio, I might have taken an area and done an area plan. Say, no, what we're working with is a particular initiative in a particular place, you know, with particular actors. And then, so the shift to the particular is, I think, one strategy by which to introduce this. How it works, and, you know, and this thing like that is a, is a mode of navigation. So it changes the nature of a pro design project. A design project is not something that you just do and get away and run away. The design project continues. It's a continuous engagement with place and, and, and uh, things. So, so we've done projects like this, you know, when we worked on Freshkill, you know, as a design thing, we, we constructed what we call a design, co I mean, a dynamic coalition. So we had very specific starting points of design 
But what we said is that there is a whole language of development that we need to focus on. The city didn't want to take, they didn't want to hear that, you know, because they want to also finish the project and, you know, the next administration comes in and does. So how to face that? And I mean, again, it's like the previous question, you know, I mean, how, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't know, but I would think that just to open this question of the particular as a key element of strategy, I think is essential, I would think. Uh, so you mean all this time it wasn't working? Does that work? Yeah, better. All right. Sorry for that. Let's swap it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you so much. Um, I was going to ask, how do you understand the developing digital environment of design and making a series of points inherently connected to the constraint of line or something theoretically? Sorry, sorry. Please, please repeat that. Sorry, I'm going really fast. Um, how do you understand the developing digital environment of design? Um, a series of points inherently connected to the constraint of line or something theoretically boundless and freeing? I'm very, I'm very tempted to say that I just don't understand. <laughs> uh, I was just telling uh, Shubhru, my, my knowledge of technology hasn't improved very much, uh, you know, in the 25 years since we were together in Berkeley. But, um, you know, the, <laughs> but I've thought about it. You know, the, you know the, the screen, the computer screen is a two-dimensional screen. I mean, it is, I mean, today it is the map. It is the, it is the map, it's mapa. You know, like I talk about the tablecloth, it's the screen, you know, it's the paper, it's the, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and it is the field of points, like saying, it's, it's, it's all about, it's, it's about the points and, and how you connect the points. The tragedy of it, I mean, I would think, the tragedy of it is that it takes away the material dimension. Like when I draw a line, I get a sense of the flow. When I connect a line with two points, it's a very different experience, you know? So as an educational tool, I feel very uncomfortable with it. I mean, and I just think that, how is it possible, you know I mean? That, that someone can grasp the essence of a line as a flow, you know? By making just a connection that comes boom, you know, connects two points. So, so there is that uh, there is that uh, that element that has been taken taken out. But if I can just extend your question a little bit, you know, in terms of in terms of the because there is an incredulity actually that is expressed with maps. How did the ancients get these maps so accurate? In, you know, without satellites and without uh, thing. and what is instead of instead of putting it like that, one should ask this question. You know, that everything that was done in the history of mapping has led to, I mean, without maps, I would never have had satellites. I would never have had the geoid by which I can start my, I work my cell phones, you know? I would, I mean, all this has come from the mapping previously. And so if now the eye and the sky is reinforced everything, it is because it has been constructed to reinforce it. So the computer is one of those things that it, it reinforces mapping. And so to some extent, I hesitate to say that what we do is mapping. I don't consider it mapping. I consider it not even counter mapping. I consider counter mapping all as, as geographic based. It's place based in that sense. So when we talk about hydrology and thing, and that's why you're sort of moving out of the whole representation urge to demonstration, because we're getting out of this, out of the mapping thing. Now, the computer, as a demonstration tool, you know, is a challenge, I would think, you know, one can get it, it's just such a, it's just so caught up as a representational tool right now. And it's a copycat, you know, it's a copycat. I mean, it's just doing from, you know, following up from the image, it's forgetting the process. So I put the computer at the end of a mapping that began with Thales, 600 BC, you know, and the computer, to me, that's all the same paradigm. So when people say, oh, we are now in a shift new paradigm, I say that's bullshit. You know, we are not. We are in the same, we are in the same geographic ground. But it's a it's a challenge for me how to take the computer into a hydrology. That's I think a, a serious. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I feel, you know. Um I if I may, I want to maybe give the computer one more chance. Um, because it, I think principally, yes, it, you could say it's a further incarnation of this thinking and definition and lines and 
but you could also say maybe, because now we have a way to visualize and map in a more complex way, actually the complexities, the circularities, we see a Sahara dust lifting off, then being pushed over half of the hemispheres and then arriving somewhere in the Amazon, wetlands, rainlands coming down, and then we see a blossoming in the Amazon, then to be flushed into the Amazonas to then arrive eventually on the coast and create an incredible algae blossoming. And this all within, you know, not too many weeks. That I think for me at least is bringing a little bit home what I think you try to tell us that that type of very understanding of being in a globe together as part of an extended um, cyclical being is what we have forgotten, which we cultivated away in a way, and yet we're fully immersed in it. And for me, therefore, maybe um, not to celebrate the computer necessarily, but it may give us perhaps back an insight that we had forgotten about. And maybe ironically, as the ultimate instrument of cultivation, it decultivates us and or reminds us we're both always at once. Yeah. Um, so for me, maybe there's hope for the people that are using the digital media, or what do you think? <laughs> it, it's it's our own creation. And uh, if if I understand him correctly, the creation is based on the worldview that we have, and and it's helping us to extend that worldview. Yeah. And uh, so I I like the computer. And because it helps me do things that uh, expands my horizon, but obviously it doesn't expand yours. So we have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. And then we, we take that seems to be a very new long long discussion. We can continue their the discussing since what twenty five years already. Um, I got signs from other members of the auditorium that we need to take off. Um, take off. Um, in new flights of thought outside, um, there is some food um, to um, nourish us and those um, new flights, lines of thought, I hope. Thank you so much. What a fantastic journeying, both of you. Thank you. You're welcome. And, uh, You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.